actually. So I'm a little bit late in bringing us all together, but I want to say welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are glad that you are here. I'm Shannon Clifford, and I'm the Executive Director of the Mesa Verde Foundation. Please join me in welcoming back Monica Buckle to moderate today's webinar. Thank you, Monica, for all you do to make our webinar series a success. We missed your guidance during the last couple of webinars and are happy you are here with us today. So please take it away. Uh, so sweet, Shannon. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and happy February. Thank you for joining the Mesa Verde Foundation. We are happy to be back after a brief winter hiatus and are delighted to offer this programming every second Tuesday of each month. Today, we are fortunate to have Stephen Mott joining us again. Stephen is a National Park Service archeologist and you might remember Stephen's informative presentation last year. It was so great and well received, we just had to get him back for part two. Stephen will give an overview of Mesa Verde National Park and explore the preservation of Mesa Verde's ancestral Puebloan architecture and its stabilization. The Mesa Verde Foundation is the official philanthropic nonprofit partner to Mesa Verde National Park. As a foundation, we secure funding for the park's capital improvements, special projects, and further promote understanding and preservation for ancestral Puebloan culture. As a foundation, our initiatives at the park are only possible due to the support and generosity of Mesa Verde Foundation fellows and members like you. We would like to thank everyone who contributed to our year-end giving campaigns, such as Colorado Gives Day and Giving Tuesday. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to the park superintendent, Casey Cook Collins, for her invaluable support. Now, circling back to our guest speaker, Stephen has been associated with Mesa Verde National Park for 15 years. He previously worked for the National Park Service at Aztec Ruins National Monument and Bandelier National Monument, both in New Mexico. His experience includes natural disaster response, emergency archaeology, burned area emergency response, and cultural resource damage assessment. Stephen graduated from Fort Lewis College with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Anthropology and a Certificate in Cultural Resource Management. He served as a teacher's assistant at Fort Lewis, overseeing archaeological excavation. Stephen has published numerous National Park Service condition and assessment reports and worked with the Department of the Interior for cultural resource damage assessment. We will be happy to take questions at the end of the presentation. If you could kindly hold them, that would be most appreciated. Now, I would like to welcome Stephen. Stephen, well, welcome back. Thank you very much. Monica, uh, let me share my screen here with you and we were just it was such a great response last year with your webinar so thank you for doing this for us again. Uh, you're welcome. Um, let me get the right one for you. Sorry about this. Let me. That's all right, Stephen. You do your thing. Um, so, sure. back in October, the board of directors from the foundation actually were up at the park for a few days. And Stephen was so kind and brought everyone to one of his stabilization projects. And it was really wonderful to see for the board of directors, just how our funding has successfully implemented projects at the park. And also it was so nice for Stephen to take time out of his day. He's a husband and a father to an adorable girl, Maya. So it's just, we're so grateful for everything you do for us. Oh, perfect. It looks beautiful, Stephen. Oh, no, if, sorry. If you go back, it was on presentation mode. Yes, there you go. I'm missing my notes again. I'm sorry. That's okay. Take your time. Um, I mean, my computer went kaputz this morning, so 
<laughs> we're all experiencing glitches, so don't worry about it. We should probably say thank you to uh, the person who loaned you a computer for this webinar, Monica. Yes. <laughs> It seems like there's always a technical issue of some sort, and we're just glad to have you here. So thanks to thanks to them. All right, Stephen, it's looking good. We have presentation mode on. Um, why is it? Sorry. Don't be sorry. These things happen more often than you would like to imagine um it's just what happens when we go live for sure all right are you guys seeing the just the first slide yes yes we are all right i got it figured out all right well you have <clears throat> the floor Stephen. do your thing all right thank you monica and thank you shannon um good afternoon thank you for the introduction i hope to build on last year's webinar and give you all a taste of what not only goes through our th thought process for stabilizing the architecture at Mesa Verde, yet also the actual work that is involved with preserving and stabilizing this world-renowned architecture. <clears throat> and uh, as uh, Monica stated, yes, please ask questions uh, throughout, but I'll try to answer those at the end. So uh, let's, let's get into it. Um, we're starting today by looking at uh, first, the mission of the National Park Service. Um, the National Park Service, sorry, I have to move the screen. The National Park Service preserves unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the national park system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. The Park Service cooperates with partners to extend the, be the benefits of natural and cultural resource conservation and outdoor recreation throughout this country and the world. Um, and, oh, sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna actually break down uh, that uh, the word unimpaired for us right now uh, as part of this uh, presentation. And, and that means showing the resource as it is, not changing it. Um, the, the dictionary meaning is to not reduce or weaken in strength or quality. So uh, to me, that, that shows that, yeah, that the resource uh, should not be changed. Um, however, looking at the, the history of stabilization archeology span over the last hundred years, um, we have to realize that uh, just through evolution uh, of our discipline that uh, we now really try to do that unimpaired uh, preservation or stabilization to it compared to say a hundred years ago where we were actually uh, excavating and stabilizing at the same time, um, having, having a whole different mindset to um, preserve these for an exhibit for educational purposes, developing Mesa Verde into a national park. And uh, fast forward a hundred years now, um, we have a whole different mindset um, of how do we continue to stabilize these and preserve these sites and keep them standing, yet do it in a way respectful for um, Native Americans, uh, the general public, other archaeologists, and, and just uh, the world heritage in general. And as we uh, move on, Along with the mission of the National Park Service comes the federal laws and regulations we follow. These laws not only guide our work, but also remind us that the protection and care for these sites extend beyond the education and enjoyment of visitors by taking into account indigenous people's concerns and consideration, considerations toward the preservation of our collective heritage, a heritage that we all need to remember is important to the future of our parks and everyone's culture. Uh, these, not, these laws not only guide how we actually do our work, but remind us of the NPS mission. And sometimes the best way to stabilize a wall is to not do anything to it. Um, let that wall go back to the earth. And those decisions are uh, tough decisions to make, especially if we're dealing with uh, 
exhibit archaeology sites uh, at, say, Cliff Palace or Balcony House, um, Long House, Step House, um, a series of other alcove sites and other uh, Pueblo Mesa top sites. Um, there are obvious decisions at times when it, it comes to the safety of everyone and other times when it's not so clear. Um, we have to consider the history of the park and how it was preserved, yet move in that positive direction and consider everyone's beliefs, values, and wants. <clears throat> um, as we move forward, uh, here's a, I'm gonna give a, a list of uh, past stabilization projects um, from uh, 2018 and 19, and the next slide, slide will show 2020 and 21. Um, on the right, we have uh, one of our Masons, uh, Heath Martin, uh, he'll be starting his fourth season with the crew. Um, his understanding to only fix what is needed is on spot, and I look forward to con contemplating future architectural fixes with him. Um, he had never done this work prior to uh, four years ago, and, and he's taken a liking and a, uh, a want to, to learn uh, stabilization archaeology, and, and his interest is is uh is key and, and yeah definitely looking forward to uh i believe may so um as you'll notice uh a lot of our projects or a lot of them a uh, few of them have uh stars near them those are emergency stabilization um some of those are from fires the moccasin mesa fire of 2018 and then also the moorfield fire of 2019 which took out probably about six to eight weeks of, uh, of project time away from doing stabilization and, and working those fires. Uh, as you'll see here, uh, the photo on the right is at Painted Hand Pueblo. Um, we started this project. It's a project with our uh, uh, Canyon the Ancients National Monument Bureau of Land Management um, uh, partnership that we have for five years. And uh, that's a, a great picture of uh, uh, Gary Etheridge, a uh, longtime stabilization crew member, soon to be retired, and um, great job doing uh, photography. Um, yeah, taking all the photos for us, so uh, as well as many other roles, um, he will be greatly missed. Uh, anyway, um, moving on with it. Uh, the next uh, slide shows our uh, our upcoming projects. Um, these are projects to be, uh, these are projected to be a week of work or up to a couple of months of work. Uh, the Hilltop Kiva project will be approximately two to three weeks of work, while the, preser uh, while the preserve and maintained Farview House will span two months of work or more. Um, we are scheduled uh, at Painted Hand along with Escalante and Dominguez Pueblos for six weeks this April and May. Uh, and then also the Yucca House project should last two weeks at the most, uh, probably just a week. And uh, other projects we have this year will be tacked on to the beginning and end of the field season and or through throughout the summer to give us a break from working on uh, on exhibit all summer. Um, and and yeah, that's uh, where the archaeological sites are on exhibit, but then uh, it seems a lot of the time the civilization crews on exhibit too, and and we will definitely answer your question if you come, um, but try to keep it short and sweet. Uh, all right, uh, a little disclaimer here too, as I've uh, been trying to um, discuss through this webinar so far, we won't just be talking about slinging mud into the walls or just pointing uh, mortar into cracks and and, and the fun that comes with that. But I look at this webinar more as a, a conversation with you about really trying to understand about the differences in using these techniques in both backcountry and front country archeological settings. Um, these techniques are not done without research and thought. The preservation issues within an alcove site can be completely different than within a Mesa top site. Also the preservation concerns at backcountry sites are different. Uh, was the pres preservation done because of, of a wildfire or a proposed interpretive exhibit that never came to fruition? Um, the examples coming up will hopefully show all these differences we interact with 
uh, because every site is not static. They are changing. Um, they are dynamic that happen, uh, excuse me, there are dynamic changes that happen throughout the year, every day and at night, every hour and every second. Uh, under, yeah, understanding backcountry and front country archaeological sites. Uh, a front country site is an archaeology site that visitors, visitors can access, learn about, and view at Mesa Verde. Uh, there are archaeological sites within the backcountry of Mesa Verde that, due to their original preservation by the Park Service over the last 50 to 100 years, raises questions on how do we continue to stabilize these backcountry sites. Um, front country sites have an entirely different focus and need. However, knowing that we, the National Park Service, added foreign materials and mortars to many of these sites, um, that uh, we have an obligation to continue to monitor those. Um, this is a list of uh, all the front country sites, uh, exhibit sites that uh, most of the, or, or all the uh, tourists can see um and, and visitors uh and this is not including the list of all the um uh, alcove sites that are from uh overlooks um both on weatherall and the chapin mace or the mesa top loop and cliff palace and balcony house loops um back energy sites as uh, as it said here are, are restricted access by the public and the majority of park personnel Backcountry sites were stabilized in the past, either after our wildfires, and as I uh, just said, um, for uh, interpretive purposes, that yeah might never have uh, might not have happened because of uh, of time, also because of money, um, or just different um, um, focuses shifting through uh, different uh, park service administrations and such. Um, Going too fast. Um, some have been, excuse me, some have been preserved due to the mindset during the growth of archaeology and historic preservation before 1966 and way before 1990, when some of the most crucial laws uh, had been passed for how we think about preservation and cultural resource management today. Uh, other backcountry sites have been stabilized in many direct and indirect ways due to wildfires and being burned over. Um, some of these considered backcountry sites that are viewable off of the Weatherill Mesa Road lean towards a front country site required, requiring extensive fabric, fabric intervention rather than just say silicone drip lines to move water away from the Nalco. And, uh, Uh, these are some examples of backcountry sites uh, that I have been um, uh, have had a privilege to work on in my uh, my past year. This site right right here with my uh, uh, the laser pointer on it um, that was in 2010, and this site is a, a, another uh, component of that site. Actually, that if you look through the back side of the doorway, you get this uh, three three or four rooms that. Uh, each doorway lines up, and and uh, the interesting thing about that is uh, just how how many say sweet doorways in different pueblos uh, throughout the uh, ancestral pueblo and world line up that way, um, and uh, it definitely reminds me of rooms I've worked at at Aztec, uh, both at Chaco and then even uh, at uh, Bandelier too. Well, Stephen, what was um, the work that you were doing? If you go back to the previous slide, in that photo that you have the laser on, what what, what stabilization work were you doing to that um, dwelling? Uh, we were we were doing mostly uh, basal erosion work. So um, a lot of uh, uh, after fires, uh, a lot of the water that. Uh, moved in came in over the alcove and uh and down and then washed the uh, mortar away at uh basal joints where the bedrock met so we were uh pointing uh, a lot of stones into yeah it's kind of the basal corners uh helping to them to uh to uh stay another 
uh, 30 to 50 years or more um, without being washed out from uh, upper watershed uh, that is uh, no longer being held by uh, trees after uh, other or numerous fires in the park. Thank you. All right, and uh, I just mentioned uh, silicone drip lines um, uh, prior to Monica's question. And as you see where my cursor's at, these are uh, silicone drip lines installed after a wildfire to, uh, to push water away from the site. So as water falls down or cascades down the sandstone, um, they'll hit the silicone drip line and bead off, bead off and, and away from the site and instead of uh, flowing into uh, the, art, the alcove and uh, causing um, an array of problems uh, both in the summertime and the wintertime. Uh, another reason to monitor these would be also silicone's uh, life expectancy is, is not like uh, that of Portland cement. You know, it's not going to just um, stay there forever. So uh, by uh, monitoring the condition of these sites, we can also go and clean up um, anything that has fallen off. Uh, but also um, note that if we need to get out and, and reapply silicone uh, caulking strips and, and other um, uh, indirect uh, ways uh, we, we focus on uh, uh, protecting sites after wildfires. <clears throat> so I'm going to move into uh, a front country stabilization. And uh, this is uh, uh, the before photo of... Uh, of a historic buttress installed by uh, Fuchs during excavation and stabilization of the Pueblo. Uh, both occurred at the same time. This is to support the lower portion of the west wall of room 46. Uh, room 46 is a second story wall and uh, the lower room is uh, room five. Um, room five has a Portland cement wall cap with a crack due to shifting of the architecture, most likely due to freeze thaw expansion and contraction, uh, foundation movement due to loss of ground moisture since excavation of the polo and changing amounts of precip precipitation in the Southwest uh, also uh, uh, contribute to this, uh, this bulging wall, this bulging buttress. Uh, the climate and seasonal conditions are changing and uh, that is resulting in, in other uh, factors that uh, we are still trying to figure out how to deal with and will continue to deal with as time uh, goes on and, and that climate always changes. Um, so in, in, the, in the middle of the screen, you can somewhat make it out. It's very hard to look on it, look on it uh, a straight view, but there is a large bulge um, in the architecture. And uh, so this is a, a a photo from uh, 1934 from uh, Stanley Morse. Uh, he uh, he was one of a of a uh, or a cartographer that was hired in the park back uh, during the 1934 season. Uh, worked with Al Lancaster and did some really good uh, close up works of the architecture here at uh, Farview and some of the other sites. and And uh, we're fortunate enough to be able to use these uh, photos from 1934 that show that uh, the architecture uh, doesn't change. Um, a lot of those stones are, are in the same place as they were uh, close to 100 years ago. And um, it also helps us to, uh, in this case for me, help, help me to reset um, a lot of these stones back into place after I had pulled them away from the wall uh, to fix this bulge and also this crack uh, in the uh, in the wall, um, you can see the the cement cap here uh, that was also applied. Um, so the room has a Portland cement wall cap with a crack due to shifting of the arch architecture. Most likely, I already read this. Um, uh, that's funny. All right. Anyway, moving on. Here's another. Um, photo, architectural photo, condition assessment from 2012, showing that uh, cement cap, also the bulge where my cursor's at. Uh, you can see the slight bulge at the top. Um, that expands out uh, even further. 
Um, here's a close-up condition uh, assessment before I um, deconstructed the wall and uh, made it um, stronger. But uh, the method to do that was uh, it's just a, a, a slow process of uh, making sure you're keeping the stones um, in order so that uh, we can put them back and reset them back in place. Um, so one question that came up while I was uh, deconstructing this wall and and um, and seeing what was really going on uh, behind this historic buttress, and it showed fill. Um, there's stone fill here. Uh, there's also it was a rudimentarily coarse uh, stone, and this is about the the only glimpse I could get within this historic buttress. Um, we are always thinking about what is going on with the architecture. Uh, that's not just uh, the, excuse me, the, it's not just the, um, the movements, the structural movements going on due to weather, but also the, the archeological content behind that wall. Um, it's uh, one way we can and re reanalyze um, these, these buttresses, these uh, compound and uh, corn veneer walls for, finding uh, prehistoric clues. And, uh, and, and here, this is something that I only can make an inference on, but um, could this have been a prehistoric buttress? Um, I'm not sure because I can pull all the stones out. I wish I could pull all the stones out, but that's also a, a time factor. And, um, and, and it's also just not the right thing to do these days. Um, we, we wanna try to do as minimal as possible, but also strengthen that wall um, but also try to uh, update the, the scientific record, uh, the archaeological record, uh, also. And uh, here's another another view of that um, stay in state progress of that of that uh, buttress wall and, and what was going on. And uh, my experience with uh, the core walls from Aztec over uh, uh, my extensive time there. Um, suggested that this was this could have been more than just say uh, fill uh, uh, inserted by Fuchs with this historic buttress wall that that maybe there could have been a uh, a prehistoric buttress. Uh, one of the things that um, made me think that was uh, where I, I found a, a, a full matate in the wall that uh, uh, was placed actually at the top. This is uh, the position of the matate right here on, on the top of the, the uh, historic uh, buttress below the uh, Portland cement cap that uh, uh, went over this historic buttress. And, and I find that um, intriguing because um, at the time, um, and I only go off of tons of historic photos of people, uh, other archeologists, excavating pueblos at the time, but they would be um, collecting and quantifying groundstone uh, for an excavation. So uh, if they were to find this in the fill of, of room five slash room 46, uh, why weren't they quantifying this matate? Um, it definitely has uh, worked edges that they were shaping it, a very nice used surface uh, right here. Um, and and yeah, no, so all I can do as a archeologist is um, um, make inferences, especially just stabilizing the wall. If I had more time, another couple of days to actually um, um, uh, peek and probe into that uh, historic buttress, um, yes, I could maybe give you a, a more clear answer, but uh, these are some of the questions that we, we deal with on a daily basis um, when we are doing stabilization. Now, um, Stephen, I have a quick question for the viewers who may not be familiar with, um, could you describe and explain what a matate is? Uh, yes, yeah, so matate, you know, I'll go back to that slide. Matate is a, uh, one of the primary artifacts uh, uh, or primary uh, utilitarian wares that, um, or, or, or are items that ancestral Pueblo and people used. It was uh, the, the base of grinding um, corn, seeds, um, minerals, 
salt. Um, many, many, many things were used for, uh, or, or used uh, on a matate to be crushed um, or broken up for both foodstuffs, um, for, for many materials that uh, we would uh, think of today and just use a grinder for. So. Thank you. All right, moving on, keeping moving on. Um, this is uh, after I had applied, uh, um, built, rebuilt the wall, more or less, um, reset many of the stones. I only replaced one stone uh, out of this. However, uh, this is right before I uh, in, uh, inserted or uh, uh, laid the Portland cement cap. So I actually used a, a mechanical um, grinder to, uh, to really cut into this cap um, to make sure that the large stones that were uh, 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 laid by Fuchs could uh, be reset into place as well as uh, make a nice tight seal uh, with that Portland cement and, and allowing it to, uh, to dry properly. And so this is a, an after stabilization photo and um, I'll show you, this is our, uh, uh, how we annotate our photos after our work is done. So once we've taken our final stabilization photo or our after stabilization photo, um, we go back and we'll record what we, what we did. So the stones that are uh, marked with green lines here, those are all set into um, Portland cement. All these other stones were reset using um, an earthen mortar and uh, uh, what we call uh, the Farview mix. And that, and that consists of uh, two buckets of red clay, one bucket of uh, yellow clay and a bucket of sand, I believe. Um, it may, might be two yellows. Um, but I actually didn't include any of the recipes of our mortar into slides here because there's so, so many. Um, we're not just dealing with uh, one site where when I was working at Aztec Ruins, we had uh, more or less two, two mortars. Uh, we had a, a Portland cement for ball capping and then a, an earthen mortar for uh, the West Ruin stabilization. And um, uh, at Mesa Verde, we, we deal with a lot more. There's um, uh, Cliff Palace, there's Balcony House, Long House, uh, the Farview sites um, right there alone are four or five, I'm losing count. Um, different types of mortar that we we try to break down and um, and and reconstitute to uh, to match the prehistoric and also the historic mortars uh, used. All right, here. So this is uh, the before photo of that wall and the after photo. Um, this this wall took me roughly six days to complete from. Uh, um, beginning to end, and um, and that's also just with uh, rain events stopping it, um, and also uh, helping to uh, helping with uh, Gary do photography. Um, we we both share that task, and and uh, and we both greatly appreciate each other's help. Um, moving on during 2020, Cliff Palace. Uh, uh, pandemic work. Uh, this is actually a uh, thank you to the foundation. We actually use some of your funds that uh, you provide for Cliff Palace to uh, be able to get in here. Um, this work uh, occurred during uh, June 2nd to June 24th. And uh, it was actually uh, work that was needed that we never could find the time to, to actually work on it. Um, it was needed repair from a, a 1996 issue and actually, uh, it's uh, it's very well documented in uh, uh, the Centennial series, uh, Dirt, Water, and Stone, um, uh, volume by Kathy Fierro. Uh, but as she uh, uh, puts it, it was uh, the end of the season, uh, so the the fall of October, November of 1996, when she and other uh, cultural resource staff discovered a leak or uh, water flowing out of the, uh, the back of Cliff Palace. Um, uh, lo and behold, they were able to find that that leak was coming from a, a broken water pipe in the parking lot. 
tied to a, a restroom there that had been slowly leaking for a couple of months, um, allowing that uh, large amount of water to then penetrate through the, the um, Mancus shale and or the sandstone to the Mancus shale layer and uh, exposing it in the back of uh, Cliff Palace. And um, this led to um, some extensive um, uh, mortar loss within original rooms in the back of Cliff Palace. And so after, um, yeah, we'd think, oh, why didn't we get it fixed in 30 years? Um, and that's because uh, of time, and, but not time and money. It also a uh, tourist concern. This was in a location in Cliff Palace that is in the very, very back. Um, we had to work using headlamps um, for those three to four weeks in very tight um, black conditions. And uh, that would have uh, definitely interrupted um, a lot of the tours at Cliff Palace. Um, also, uh, the season too, uh, being in the very furthest back of uh, the alcove, it was actually kind of cold working in those rooms uh, in June. So just trying to get the right conditions uh, for that mortar to cure also is, is a concern. And, and then also just because of the pandemic and, and not having visitors for uh, 2020 in these sites, gave us that time to actually get in here and 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 get this work done and uh the work that happened was uh is just phenomenal the, the the patience that's needed to not dislodge these stones yet um point copious amounts of mortar in there uh definitely is a is a is a art form and and um but also just tedious work on your knees uh, so yeah, thank you again. Thank you, Foundation, for for oh, yeah, getting us those funds to get that work finally finished. Um, some backcountry work we worked on this uh, past summer was at Spring House. It was the first time we were able to get to the backcountry in uh, and close to ten years, um, uh, and uh, that was just due to uh, um, uh, different um, um, objectives uh, that we were focused on for. Uh, taking care of the exhibit sites here at Mesa Verde. Um, and so at Spring House, uh, how do we how do we take care of leaning architecture? You know, this this leaning architecture uh, here and at other sites has been leaning for 100 years, 200 years, 500 years. And and some of this stuff has been um, uh, this architecture has been stabilized just right into place. So how do we do it? We just do as minimal as possible and point the basal stones here, replace some of the stuff that might be hydrated, uh, but we don't try to jack the wall back into place because it's not, not necessary. It's, uh, it's, it's a backcountry site. It's not gonna, um, if it falls over, um, yes, we lose that wall, but it's also allowing it to go back, back to the nature, go back to earth. And, uh, and if we had a, uh, a wall like this leaning and it fell over at Cliff Palace and, and it fell onto the trail, of course, we would look at that completely different. But uh, being backcountry, we do try to do as minimal as possible. So, um, and actually here, uh, we actually did a dry stack. We didn't even uh, do wet masonry for this wall here because uh, right in this area was a original floor, multiple floors. You could see the the charcoal line, uh, the floor line as well. Um, and we just didn't want to get in there and disturb that intact cultural fill. So backcountry sites definitely have a soft hand um, approach to doing the work. Um, the next photo shows room 43. This is a second, third story architectural crack that, uh, ex uh, that spanned the the north side, and this is uh, one of our uh, our volunteers, Dan. He's been coming back for uh, probably ten years now. He was part of a first part of a Sierra uh, Club uh, uh, group that came here a few times in the, the 2010s, and uh, and then he and a, a few of their good friends um, uh, reached out to us to find out if they could come back uh, to help us stabilize because they really enjoyed. Um, working on the architecture, being in Mesa Verde, 
and um, and being able to uh, help us preserve these these phenomenal wall uh, walls. And, uh, and, and that's another thing I'll, I'll plug. If you're, if you're local and you want to be a, a volunteer and, and say help with the stabilization, um, there's numerous ways you can contact us. Um, one way would be just going through visitor, the visitor center and uh, interpretation and getting involved, uh, volunteering with them. And, and if you do have special skills or, or a retired Mason and, and want to come and, uh, and help us, uh, they'll uh, shoot us emails too to to get in touch with you. Um, so that those second and third story architecture are part of this um, this large uh, original wall that's still standing with a, a, a wooden scaffold erected in the back. Um, here is a, on the right is a, a photo of one of the columns. Uh, that spring house is known for other than the spring that is actually just down to the um, uh, to the left of this column. I don't really have a picture of this spring, but uh, uh, these uh, columns were are, are two of three columns uh, or pillars, uh, architectural pillars that were are preserved and, and still standing when they came in um, uh, the Weatherills and, and Norton Schold and others. Uh, discovered Mesa Verde a hundred years ago, uh, and these are still standing. Um, these are some of the um, only pillars or columns that are uh, known in the Southwest, as uh, I've been told by uh, um, other archaeologists working here and uh, and in the area. Uh, so it's definitely a special uh, or unique trait, unique feature to Spring House and Mesa Verde. Um, so before stabilization, this is open area three. This is one of the, the areas I worked also sitting above a, uh, a Kiva, uh, Kiva C, I believe. Um, and uh, try to give you a close up of this, uh, but uh, this location is, so this is where the two, second and third story um, architecture, architectural crack actually, you can see the very top of it. Uh, um, that the area that we can't apply because it's um, it's just too hard to get to. Uh, we, it's too hard to use ropes and, and just too delicate of an area to even attempt that um, where we would actually have a better chance of knocking over the tops of walls. And, and so it would be better just to leave it as is and not even try to do that. Just uh, also being in, a, in either a front country or a back country setting. Um, Anyway, so those two columns are more or less ones like right here and ones right here on the other side of this wall. And I was uh, tasked to come in and, uh, and stabilize this crack. This crack is a structural crack, vertical crack that has uh, expanded just a little bit since Al Lancaster um, stabilized this site uh, in the 40s. And um, something interesting that came up about it is that. Uh, as soon as I pulled out uh, Al Lancaster's yellow um, soil cement uh, uh, mortar, um, there's Portland cement behind um, behind that that mortar crack. So uh, we we did not know this uh, when when a full condition assessment of Spring House uh, occurred in I believe 2014. Um, and this is just one of the the ways that uh, as archaeologists and masons. We can uh, extend um, the the archaeological record uh, of of what is actually really going on and how are these walls stabilizing and 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 holding together for so long. Um, Lancaster probably threw some cement in here, um, thinking that hey, this this wall is uh, associated with these two columns. Those two columns. Um, I'm going to go back a couple of slides. Those two columns here are supporting um, original um, roofing material. Uh, so that wall is, is more or less right here. And all that, um, that wall is, yeah, supporting that roofing material, connecting to those pillars. Everything is integrated. So by uh, putting in Portland cement into the wall, knowing that it's not going to move, um, but then also 
um, putting earthen material over that to disguise that uh, really strong, um, durable fix is, uh, is, is really uh, something really cool to, uh, to just even be able to work on, knowing that um, the next person that, that worked here uh, or the last person was Al Lancaster. And now I have the, um, hopefully the capabilities of doing what he did for the site and, and keeping it uh, standing for another hundred years. Um, this is the close up of, of that site, of that work. That uh, material, the cement was in this location here. Um, I covered that all up with uh, another earthen material, earthen mortar. Um, and, uh, and as you can see, the minimal approach occurred to this wall. However, the work completed will give insight to how much movement the ground is pulling away or down canyon from the alcove by this masonry joint pulling apart over time. So uh, as we go back to Spring House in years to come, looking at the areas that I pointed along with some of uh, the other areas that were not um, uh, removable in, uh, from Al Lancaster um, will give us insight to if there's, if there's any movement uh, downslope. So this is uh, another annotation of us, uh, of what we, how we annotate that, that crack and show how we, or what we did. Uh, this is uh, another, a uh, little bit of stabilization we did um, on Kiva B in Spring House. Um, notice the original prehistoric uh, uh, Viga beam here, along with uh, a lot of uh, intact uh, roofing deposits. Um, a lot, uh, there's a, a floor here. Um, and so what did I do? This is the before, this is the after photo. One can really tell, you could say <laughs> you didn't do much. You, you, you remove the bush that's in the right hand corner of the screen. That's all you pretty much did. Um, and, and, it, and it does look like that. And that's what it's supposed to look like. However, what I did was um, extensively filled in or repointed these masonry joints under here. I actually, uh, you can't see what I did under here, but I um, was able to wedge a couple of uh, kind of fish sized stones in the mortar to help keep these two stones that are falling with the Viga uh, in place so that um, any ground movement, any, any shifting of uh, of uh, architecture, any animals that might jump through here and knock on a, a, or crawl on the Viga are not gonna cause this to, uh, to fall apart and causing more um, architectural failure, potentially uh, exposing uh, artifacts and, and other things that um, uh, could cause us to do uh, further excavation because Spring House is actually a, a, a very, uh, few and far between visited site, but is is has been visited by tourists and could be uh, on the schedule. Who knows in the in the future for more visitation. All right, so um, a little bit of uh, talk about our painted hand pueblo, um, our backcountry architecture. This is backcountry architecture in Canyon of the Ancients that is gonna get a front country stabilization work. And that's due to uh, the amount of visitation that occurs here at Painted Hand Pueblo. Uh, the uh, archeologist uh, uh, Vince McMullen, McMillan uh, reached out to us uh, back in 2018, 19 to, uh, to work on these sites. Lowry Ruin is an, another one. You saw some examples last year on, on that. And, uh, and as he said, he, you know, he would like to do the work himself, but knowing that we have a Mesa Verde stabilization crew that specializes in this type of work uh, just around the corner uh, or down the street, you'd rather contract with us to have us do it. And uh, I mean, that's definitely uh, really cool to hear. And I thank him for that. But uh, I, I still get anxiety knowing that I will be working and, and slowly stabilizing this 
this upper area of the wall. Um, as you can tell, when I say we're going to put a front country uh, edge to it, uh, we actually will be reconstructing um, one, two, three, four, five, about seven to eight courses uh, of this of this area of the of the tower, and that's actually to prevent um, for both safety uh, reasons and and then safety for the the prehistoric architecture, but also safety towards visitors. Uh, we want to keep visitors out of there. Um, if if and as this becomes a, a heavily visited site in Canyon and Ancients, um, it is our goal to not allow or make it very difficult for um, people that want to get into the tower to not get into the tower um, because they that's when um, issues happen. That's when stones fall, walls fall, and we want to prevent that as possible. So uh, in 2022, we are doing some extensive stabilization, but for the common good and, and also just to help educate um, the people of the Southwest and uh, the US and the world. Um, another uh, part of our job is not just doing stabilization, just not just uh, doing repointing, resetting and replacing of stones. Uh, we also do rock hazard removal at Mesa Verde. Um, and, uh, and yeah, in addition to site preservation activities generally associated with stabilization, the crew has taken an active approach to assess and remediate hazards from falling rock within the alcove sites with the immediate goals of assessing a potentially dangerous situation and returning the site to a safe condition for park visitors and staff. One of the other parts uh, of the job is, is yeah, doing rock hazard abatement and uh, Recently, our, uh, one of our Masons, uh, Christopher Snyder, uh, has now uh, been trained and will be uh, training the other members of the, the crew to, uh, he's trained as a trainer for fall protection and high angle access. And we have the knowledge and capabilities on the crew to um, assess and, and knock um, dangerous stones off of, uh, of the cliffs to keep uh, not only tourists safe, but also um, our park colleagues and, and anyone that enters these sites. And um, here's a, a, a little uh, video of showing how, how easy it is to uh, um, move a, uh, a 50 to 100 pound stone and, and using gravity to, to, to just let it fall. I don't know why, there we go. And and it what and uh, yeah, I'll play that again. And just to let you guys know, disclaimer: the trail was not damaged in this. Um, where we were seeing from there, it sounded like it hit the trail, but it had missed the trail. And and uh, sounds from eighty feet up are a lot different, especially when you can't see over the cliff. But all you can do is film it. And I have a blank slide. All right. Anyway, continuing on, um, we've had uh, the uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, get a uh, ancestral lands crew here at Mesa Verde, and uh, the ancestral lands program is vital to having is vital to the public land in the Southwest and having Native American youth ages 18 to 25 work alongside National Park Service and other public lands. Uh, crews in preserving and maintaining their ancestral archi architecture. Uh, my hope is these youth will one day want to come back to Mesa Verde and or all the other sites, uh, NPS and public land sites they work at and, and want to work permanently there on a stabilization or and in cultural resources. Uh, maintenance alike anywhere, uh, any of the divisions is, are great. And, um, but yeah, my experience with ancestral lands crew and uh, program dates back to 2014 at Aztec Ruins National Monument. And uh, this crew here, the Zuni crew, there are members on this crew that actually, once we started talking and, and, uh, and remembering uh, 
just different experiences. Um, uh, we realized that both of two of them were trainees at the time, but um, uh, we all remembered having a, a bear encounter, uh, a mother bear and cubs encounter. Uh, we all sh shared together at East Ruin in, uh, I believe it was 2015 or, or 16. And, uh, and uh, that, that actually made work uh, so much more meaningful to know that um, uh, they, they remember me, I remember them. And uh, it just, uh, it shows how, how close natured and close knit um, the, the stabilization and historic preservation world can be. Um, everybody I've worked with within the historic preservation and stabilization, um, if at Bandelier, Aztec, and Mesa Verde, um, definitely still keep in contact with them today and, and use them as a, uh, a network for, for ideas that I can't think of or, or I might need help with. Uh, but uh, again, this uh, we're applying for and, and should have another ancestral lands crew here uh, this summer to continue to work on the Farview sites. Um, and uh, as well, while we were, while, excuse me, while the Ancestor Lands crew was here uh, this past summer, we had the, the Mesa Verde Foundation visit and they were able to see uh, the work they were doing in Kiva A. Um, the amount of work that they actually completed was uh, uh, outstanding. Um, they, they moved, uh, we dealt with a lot of uh, weather events this year, um, as well as some other um, um, events that, uh, didn't allow us to get the, the crew here, their full uh, four hitches. And, and we plan to bring them back um, this spring, as well as uh, bringing another uh, a crew here in probably July to, uh, to fulfill um, the funding that we received through the uh, youth, young adult and volunteer program within the Intermountain region of the Park Service. Um, and and so, yeah, this, uh, I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the uh, Mesa Verde Foundation's past and continued support. The stabilization crew will continue to maintain the original standing Pueblo masonry. That is the essence of our park. Uh, the preservation preserves the legacy of the ancestral Pueblo people for their descendants and will enable the public to be educated about and enjoy these sites for generations to come. Thank you to you all for letting me present on what it what it takes to preserve the architecture at Mesa Verde National Mon or at Mesa Verde National Park. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen. This was so wonderful. And this is a photo of you and your daughter, Maya. Uh, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Now, at which dwelling are you at or which site? Um, this is actually at a uh, mug house. And this was on a uh, backcountry tour uh, with my father and uh, my wife, Jenny and daughter, uh, Maya. And, um, yeah, it was, uh, his first time to mug house and, and, uh, definitely a, a long overdue visit for him. And, and he's definitely planning on visiting some other sites with us and Maya. Okay, great. Well, we have some questions coming in, but before I get to them, you had spoke about the story of uh, the mama bear with her cubs at one stabilization project. Do you ever encounter other critters up at the park on these job sites? Uh, yes, yes, we do. We, uh, uh, we encounter uh, many, many critters uh, from uh, rabbits to, I'm trying to think of something that we've uh, uh, ran into specifically horses. Um, I know some of the um, Gary and um, um, uh, older crew members, uh, Neil Smith, have stories of uh, interacting with horses, uh, but also uh, we see uh, mountain lions. Um, Keith and I were on a, a, a backcountry monitoring of the Moorfield, no, Moxon Mesa Burn Scar. Uh, a couple of years ago, and he he nonchalantly said, "Oh, well, there's a mountain lion watching you, or watching <laughs> us, you know." And I was off doing work. I was about 30, 40 yard, yards away, um, recording, um, documenting, uh, taking pictures, and and I said, "Where?" And he was like, "Oh, don't worry, it's a, it's across canyon, but uh, line of sight. It was probably 100, 150 yards away, line of sight, but 
uh, would have had to climb another canyon to get to us. So we were just fine, safe. Um, we got our work done and, and got out of there. And But it definitely does kind of give you the chills sometimes. Sure, those cats that, stalk um, and they stalk at a distance too. Yep. So. Okay, well, well, thank you, Stephen. We have some questions. I think one of um, the questions from Gloria, you kind of mentioned during the presentation, her question is, do... Um, Sorry, let me get to it. Why do you remove rocks from the buildings? Uh, so one reason to uh, remove stone from uh, some of the walls is that because uh, of how hydrated they get, they get um, they uh, they'll pull moisture into them um, throughout time, and and that moisture causes them to break down slowly. Um, causing them to slowly erode or say kind of turn into dust um, um, where we can actually brush the stone away from from within the wall a lot of the times and and then we'll have to remove the remaining part of that stone and then and then replace it with a uh, sturdy stone for that wall. Okay, thank you. This is a question from John. Do all of the walls at Farview have Portland cement caps? Good question. Um, I believe every every wall cap at Farview Great House definitely has a, a Portland cement wall cap, um, and that was uh, that ties into the history of the site as well as uh, uh, the stabilization practices. Uh, say 100 to 70, 75 years ago, um, before we realized that uh, Portland cement was. Um, Cause actually harder of a material than sandstone and would, was causing the sandstone actually to erode out of the wall, erode out of the Portland cement joints um, that was used to apply or applied to the, the wall cap. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the wall cap at uh, Farview Great House, uh, once before, um, uh, I believe it was the 80s, um, we allowed visitors to walk on the wall cap at Farview Great House as well as Sun Temple. However, due to liability and just being a, not that safe for uh, the amount of visitation we receive every summer, um, uh, we've ended that, that practice and, and we are left with Portland cement wall caps. And um, uh, actually Gary Etheridge uh, applied a, a, uh, uh, experimental wall cap um, using some uh, synthetic membranes to help uh, see if we can actually control um, cracking and uh, moisture from penetrating inside uh, larger areas or larger cores of uh, cores of walls, um, uh, interstitial spaces between kivas and rooms. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, this is um, another question. Let's see, we, we touched on Gloria's. Um, this is a question from Morgan. If it took six days to document and rebuild a wall, how long would it have taken to build it originally? Factor quarry, shape, and setting. Um, so yeah, that's a great question. And, um, and that's something we'll, we'll never know. Um, we can look at um, at the chronological record. Uh, I'm going to go back to Aztec ruins for this one. Aztec ruins national monument has uh, the dendrochronology or the tree rings and beams to uh, provided in its uh, preservation over the last thousand years, showing that um, the ancestral Pueblo uh, people built um, uh, Aztec in in a matter of twenty to thirty years. Um, so that could be, uh, that, that just shows that they did have the organization to collect the stones um, as well as the mortar uh, and water, the copious amounts of water to use to then um, organize, organizationally build these pueblos. Thank you. Um, the questions just keep on coming in. It's wonderful. So everyone, if you have a question, you know, we don't mind staying on longer. 
This is another question from John. Can you give us an update on the Spruce Tree House? What work needs to be done before it can be reopened to visitors? When do you think, is there a date when it'll be reopened to the public? Um, could you restate that? End sure, of, of course, Sorry. no worries. So basically John wants to know when um, the work will be done to Spruce Tree House and when it's gonna reopen to visitors. Um, Spruce Tree House, so to answer that question, is uh, we are starting uh, the work right now. We had a, a, a NEPA process to uh, identify any concerns with it uh, within the public over uh, in January, and we're reviewing those responses and uh, supposedly to start work um, in 2023 hopefully opening a Spruce Tree house uh, sometime at the end of 23 to FY24. Sorry for that. <laughs> That's Daughter okay. just got home and I could actually, she might. Um, so moving on, we have a question from Andre. In very fragile places like open area three, why can't scaffolding be used to gain? Hi, is that Maya? Hi, you're on a webinar. <laughs> so nice. All right, well, you've got your stabilization crew right next to you now. So, um, Stephen, I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions. I know your family just got home, but uh, oh, very good. fragile places like open area three, why can't scaffolding be used to gain access? instead of ropes or ladders? So uh, partially it's also the backcountry setting too. Um, that whole area of spring house, the, the ground, the ground surface that's never been excavated and uh, to, uh, to put supports um, to get up to a second or third story level or fourth story level um, is, is just too extensive and too, uh, uh, too harming to the uh, delicate um, uh, condition of the, uh, the, the cultural deposits in the alcove. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll just wrap up with a few more questions. This is from Chris. He wants to know um, how many sites are on the stabilization list. Um, basically, what about the backcountry sites that are not visible or non-alcove sites? Are they on the list? Um, they... Uh, we are uh, in the process of uh, re-looking at our backcountry program and uh, adding uh, and, and yes, keeping uh, certain sites that have been on the list to uh, to maintain and and at least do condition assessments to, uh, as well as adding other ones as as we come across them that we might not have known about. Sure. Um, and let's see how many people. Do you have on the stabilization crew? Do you need more on your crew? Uh, yes, we do need more on our crew. And, and hopefully over the next uh, three to five years um, and, and longer, um, we can and uh, get, get more people. But we have, uh, um, uh, how many do we have on the crew right now? We have one uh, before retirement, um, before Gary's retirement, um, one, two, three, four, five people where you bring on another Mason. So we'll have six people this year, uh, minus five once Gary um, retires. So about five people on the crew, four to five people. Um, yes. All right, well, I think we're just gonna wrap it up. You've got your hands full there. I see that Maya's like, forget a webinar. I want all your attention. <laughs> so Actually, she's. She <laughs> Well, thank you, Stephen, so much for giving us another part two into st your stabilization work, which is invaluable to the park because without the work you're doing, as well as your colleagues, there wouldn't be the integrity at these sites that there is. And thank you for taking the time. And I'm just so happy Maya could join us at the end. She's so sweet. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you so much, uh, Monica and Shannon. And, and I look forward to... Uh, the future foundation um, support, but also future foundation interactions with you all. Okay, great. And thank, well, you, thank you, Stephen. <laughs> Bye. Sorry, Monica. Didn't mean to interrupt. Thank you all for joining us.
Thank you.